So a couple of things that I'd like to do this morning is, oh, first thing I want to do is, uh, where's Debbie? Where's your wife, Daryl? Okay, we'll wait. We'll wait a second. Hey, let me uh, undergird the, uh, reinforce the announcement about the men's gathering at the village this coming Thursday night. So really hope all of you guys can make it. And uh, uh, I think we're having grilled burgers and dogs uh, this time. So, and we were going to do it outside, but I hear it's supposed to be like uh, cold. Not like cold, it's going to be cold. <clears throat> All right, well, I'll wait for uh, Miss Debbie. It's going to be so embarrassing when she comes in and Daryl tells her later. <laughs> Every year, this month, October, I pull this out of my little nook it's my hiking stick, my staff. Uh, so <clears throat> this is a reminder of several things, good friendships and uh, friendships that encourage one another and cover one another in prayer. So 23 years ago on a little dirt roadway in Petty Jean State Park, um, I was talking with Daryl Kirkland and I said, man, I need to, I'm going to go walk through the woods and see if I can't find a... Uh, a good limb that will make a good walking stick so that I don't have to pay for one. It's not because I'm cheap, but so that I don't have to buy one at the store there. And, uh, you know, and every year I put little markings on the side. So uh, 23 years ago, I can't even tell you what cabin I stayed at. Oh, no, I stayed in a tent that year. Uh, so every year I just do, I would just write something down to just kind of mark the, Mark the time. But what I remember most about this is Daryl, we were talking about the Lord. I don't even remember what all we were talking about, just life in the Lord. Looking for a limb, and then we saw one, not on the ground, but up in a tree, <laughs> that Daryl climbed the tree. Uh, and I think you had a, it was a pathetic little saw that we brought along. And he cut this thing, and that is 23 years ago. Uh, we were friends before then. But it's 23 years of uh, walking together. So this leans <clears throat> in the corner. And whenever I take a little hike, a long hike, it's got other places I've hiked, like Germany and uh, some other places. But uh, it means most to me because of my friend, Daryl Kirkland. And speaking of uh, friends and family, Daryl and Debbie have an announcement. We tried to get a picture, but we have a new addition to the Kirkland establishment. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Amen. All right. Now I'm going to ask if Stan and Daryl would both come up here. I didn't ask permission to do this, not because I'm rebellious, but I just forgot. So uh, uh, for you, those of you that are uh, maybe guests, I don't really see any. Flora, this is the first time I've cast eyes on you since you got back from Israel. Yes, I can take you off that part of my prayer card, which is pretty full at this point for you. Uh, it's good to see you, though. <clears throat> we, um, we have all three been friends for a very, very long time. You know the story of Daryl and Stan. Uh, I met a few decades ago also, and he was asked to be an elder of this church a long time ago. And then when I became pastor in May of 1996, um, all of the elders, I don't know when they agreed to do this, but they said, let's just all step down and give Craig an opportunity to build the leadership team that he wanted to, to build, uh, like I knew how to do one in the first place. But uh, that was in 96, <clears throat> and immediately after we said yes, we'd pastor the church, we uh, took, Diane and I took 40 members of then City Christian Fellowship, now Hope 
fellowship to Jamaica for a mission trip uh, and, and brought 36 back. No, he brought 40 back. <coughs> and uh, so when I got back, I asked Stan and Patty if they would pray about coming back as elders, even though he had just been brought on as elders probably just weeks or months prior to that. I want you to know that uh, if you don't know already, we're in the midst of a transition. Transitions are, don't have to be bad. In fact, they can be great. Uh, if you've been driving an old automobile and you finally got enough, enough money to buy a new automobile, uh, so you're in the transition from the old one to the new one, the papers are being done, same thing with a home. You're in an old house and you've got more kids and you need more room. You transition, you buy a house, takes a little while for the old house to get all the things that you're going to bring to the new house, leave the things you don't want in the old house. I want you to know I love both of these men. Uh, I, uh, with, I mean, with a deep affection spiritually. And I trust these men, and we've trusted one another for a very, very long time. We are not perfect, uh, but the Lord is. And uh, I just want you to know that we stand together. I stand with them, and I stand back, not as the pastor, but as a, just an elder at this point to support them. And uh, I want you to do the same thing, just to pray for them, just stand with them. And this is what I believe. The cool thing about being able to step back is I get a little bit of a different vantage point. I get to see some things that I didn't get to see before from a different perspective. And uh, I'm just beginning to see some things that I'm very excited about. One of the things that I am praying for and I believe is going to take place is I think in this particular season of our city and state and country and the world, we have the opportunity to see this place uh, really being a, a birthing house for new life. And that's the way I want you to pray. We're going to pray now for these guys, and we're going to pray for the Word. Father, thank you so much for uh, your sovereignty and your providence. I thank you for my brothers and leaders, guys that I trust and who are extremely capable under your hand to lead us forward. And God, we, we move forward not in a tentative way, we trust you. You're the God of all hope. And we trust you, Lord, as we look to you for this great adventure that you have allowed us to be in. At this point in time, it's not a surprise to you. It's not a random thing that we are living in this moment. Lord, help us to take great pride for you in this opportunity that you've placed before us. We had no idea Submitted vessels to the kingdom of God are activated supernaturally. And what you can do in and through us will amaze us if we will just but say, yes, Lord. Amen. 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 Okay. All righty. <clears throat> so um, behind me is a table. I should have, I'm going to pull it over here a little bit. Just kind of want you to watch this throughout the morning. Kind of tell me what you see. Barbara's. Barbara's it's actually a quake, but, but that's good, Stan. Uh, so, um, all right. <clears throat> Let me get us going here. Oh, I'm going. Uh, there are several versions of the Bible. I put two versions up here for this morning. This is my text for this morning. It's out of Acts 20, 24. But I do not account my life for any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That's the ESV, the new, uh, I mean, the uh, NLT says this, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. Now think, let that sink in, not just an assignment from a person, but the king of all creation, the one that's spoken in all, into existence, manages and sustains it all, and knows when he wants to close it down. He is the one that has given the follower of Jesus an assignment. I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful 
grace of God. So um, my mission this morning that I feel like I'm supposed to do is to bring you encouragement, hope, and peace. Encouragement, hope, and peace manifest in you when you know why you exist and when you're effectively fulfilling your purpose in life. So like when you know what you're supposed to do and you pursue it with a whole heart. Uh, have you ever heard the phrase, you ever been with somebody and they're, I don't know if they're, get, they're getting ready to snow ski for the first time or water ski for the first time or whatever it might be. Uh, and they, they do it a few times, they become good at it and they, you know, they're having a great time and they're just like, they'll say the phrase, I was made for this. I was made for this. This is great. Um, every single follower of Jesus has divine design. And this morning I want to bring to you what I hope and pray is going to be encouragement, hope, and peace. Diana has uh, some kind of app or something on her phone, an email or something, and it's uh, it, it's. It's a Webster app, but anyway, daily, she gets a new word, a brand new word pops up every moment or every, once a day, and it's a word, and she'll read the word, and typically, she will find me, and she'll go, Craig, have you ever heard this word so-and-so, and sometimes I've heard of the word, and sometimes I haven't. Are you guys warm in here today? Deb's fanning. I think we ought to turn the AC on a little bit. Huh? Take your jacket off. You think it's me? Debbie was fanning. I'm just trying my best. I'm serving Debbie Kirkland this morning. Um, so, a few weeks ago, I woke up with this word kind of just playing through my mind the word insatiable. Now, it's not a word that I was totally unfamiliar with, but it's a word that just wasn't common in my vocabulary. It's not something where I would go up and, I just don't use the word insatiable a lot. So it just kind of kept coming up as in a pattern. And I thought, man, um, what's the deal? I'm gonna go see what this word means and if there's anything significant to it. So I did. Insatiable by the Oxford Dictionary is defined this way, always wanting more of something not able to be satisfied, like an insatiable appetite, an insatiable curiosity, an insatiable thirst. Insatiable, always wanting more of something, not able to be satisfied, an insatiable appetite, curiosity, or thirst. Uh, I think... This is at least one of the definitions for a genuine follower of Jesus. I think a genuine follower of Christ has an insatiable appetite to love God more, to experience God more, to know more about Him. But what about the Apostle Paul, Craig, when he said, be content with all things? Well, that's relative to everything in the world that is tangible. And the only thing that it does not cover is our hunger for God. We are to never, ever not be pursuing and hungry to know more about the Lord. Never. So uh, since we're talking about Paul, let's use Paul for a little example here. Yep. Let me back up. This is out of Acts 20, verse 17 through 24. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. Paul is the one that uh, he is speaking of when I read this. But when we landed, we Luke is saying, hey, when we landed at uh, Miletus, Miletus, he, that is Paul, sent a message to the elders of the church at Ephesus asking them to come and meet with him. When they arrived, he declared, you know that from the first day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears, and I've endured many trials. 
many trials that came to me through the plotting of the Jews. Now, we're at a time right now, I thought I better qualify this a little bit um, because there's so much things that we're, so much that we're seeing on the news, just the name Jew and Israel. So what Paul is talking about here is the resistance that was coming from the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious establishment, because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on to say this, I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. Church takes place here in the congregation and in smaller venues and homes. And he said, in those venues, I only had one message that I ever shared over and over and over, both for the Jews and the Greeks alike. The necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. Now I am bound by spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me there, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. <laughs> Here's that insatiable hunger. Paul says, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. And that is the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Paul was a follower of Jesus. Paul knew that he had an assignment. He knew what that assignment was. His particular assignment was to, the same assignment that we have, which is to tell the world what Christ has done to liberate us. His was, his manifested in a different way because he had a different role. But man, it's the same message. It's the same assignment that any follower of Jesus has. You know, I was with about 40 pastors last Monday, and uh, we were listening to a guy from Greece, uh, ironically. And he was talking about, uh, I say that to Daryl and Debbie, ironically, because their kids are missionaries from our church and others uh, in, in Athens. But... Um, he brought out something that I'm still kind of tracking to see if it's accurate, but he said, I just challenge you, and I will challenge this body this morning. Go and see where the miracles and where the deliverances took place. Go and see where the activity of God that we all gather in buildings to see in churches, and uh, uh, you know, go and see where those took place. Well, he said, I want to challenge you because I think all of it took place outside the walls of the church. I think it all took place, he says, in the synagogue. That's where they were meeting. The miracles, the deliverance, the salvations were all in the marketplace. And then he went down this little trail of using the Greek word marketplace and what it actually meant. And it meant those places where we go to school, where we go to work. Those places where when Jesus sets us free, we're so excited that we want to tell people about that wherever we are. And then he said, could it possibly be that the reason we're not seeing what we want to see out there among those who need to hear it and experience it, is because we're always trying to get them in here. But that must just be for those that are in the office of an evangelist. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Read the word. Always read the word. Okay. So, I think I want to show you this morning three things that are uh, three things that are going to be present in the life if you're a genuine follower of Jesus in a, in a cascading order that you're going to find present in your life if indeed you're a follower of Jesus. Three things. Number one. Number one is an insatiable hunger for God's presence. You just want to be with the one that has given you life. You want to be with the one that has given you purpose. You want to be with the one that has given you direction. Because suddenly, as a follower of Jesus, all the other things are, are, are fading in their value. And suddenly you see they're not that important. Let me read some passages to you. They're behind me. Psalm 143, verse 6. I lift my hands to you in prayer. I thirst for you as a parched land thirsts for the rain. You remember the drought that we had? Was it year before last summer? I mean, we were just, we had things that died on our property. Big oak trees because they were, they lacked water. Psalm 142 verse 5 says, then I pray to you, O Lord, I say, you are my place of refuge. 
And listen to this line that the psalmist says. And this is, I chose this morning to use, I, re, I study out of the uh, ESV. This is all out of the NLT this morning versions. David says, you are all I really want in life. Is that the kind of passion that you have? Psalm 42, real familiar. First four verses. First verse, let's just stop there. As the deer longs for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Psalm 116, verse 12. What can I offer the Lord for all that he has done for me? These are the words of men here that hunger for something that changed their life. And that something was Jesus Christ. Let me go to one more example, blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10. When they reached Jericho, that is Jesus and his disciples, they, uh, they left town and a large crowd was following them. And a blind beggar, whose name was Bartimaeus, was sitting beside the road. He sat there most every day. He'd heard about Jesus, and he'd heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby. And when he heard he was close by, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And people standing around said, be quiet. They yelled at him, just hush. But Bartimaeus shouted all the louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. Now, he's blind. He sits by the road every day. Jesus is passing by. He hears about it. He didn't have the ability to go find him, but he's nearby. So they called the blind man and said, cheer up. Come on, he, Jesus Christ, the one you're calling to, he's calling for you. And hungry Bartimaeus to see a radical change take place in his existence threw aside one of the most valuable things in his possession, his coat. And he jumped up and he came to Jesus. Use that in your mind, your imagination. A blind man jumps up and tries to run to the voice. And I'm sure there were people trying to direct him, but he was a desperate man. And he knew Christ was the one that could change his desperate situation. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus said. <laughs> My rabbi. He had already acknowledged. You're my Lord. You're the one that can change my situation. My rabbi. I want to see you. And Jesus said, go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see and follow Jesus down the road. An insatiable hunger in a man who wanted to see his situation change, who's confronted with Jesus Christ, who has to put forth some effort to get to Jesus Christ, even the voices that were saying, just hush up. Hush up, there's, he, there's more important things and more important people in a different mission that he's on than to tend to what you've got going on, so be quiet. Okay, I will. Jesus, son of David. No, he was persistent because he was desperate and he knew Christ could change his situation. We have a city full of people who are desperate who need to see their situations changed. And they're crying out. Because their hearts were fabricated, made by God to be in sync, in unison with God's heart. And everything else that they do. You know, I got to hear from someone, uh, well, uh, two sources. One was for actually, but when the uh, uh, Hamas invaded and just did horrific things that they were all already as kids, just trained to hate, but then they pumped them up on methamphetamines before they sent them into battle. So, 
We have that all over our city. People are just running for something because they're desperate, because they're blind. And we have the solution. We have the only hope that they're ever going to know that will actually change their life more than just a temporary thing or something that kills them. And that's Christ. In the life of a believer of Jesus Christ, a genuine follower who cares more about knowing, loving, knowing, and following Jesus, he's going to have an insatiable hunger for the presence of God. That's why we like worship. That's why we like to worship, because that's what we were made to do. An insatiable hunger in a genuine follower of Jesus will never get enough of God's word, never get enough time in prayer, never be able to thank God enough for what he's done in their life, never get enough genuine, solid, good worship time. Amen? Amen. I mean, you're just different. You know, it was interesting. One of the things that I've learned since I've stepped aside as pastor and still uh, uh, is this. You know, because, you know, I, I hear and I've heard pastors at conferences of thousands of pastors and, and uh, even these guys that, were, that I was with last week in northwestern Arkansas. Statistics reflect that a lot of pastors, the only time they spend in the Word and in prayer is when they're preparing for a sermon to address to the people. The larger percentage of pastors, that's when they spend their time in the Word. And I thought, man, you know, not that I haven't done that at times, but most of the time I just want to get with Jesus because he saved my life. Uh, because I didn't have life. I had some counterfeit thing going on. And, you know, I wondered, is my, because you know, and it's not, I'm not trying to make it a badge or say that I'm any more spiritual than the next guy. But, but now, uh, one of the benefits is that, man, instead of having an hour or two, I mean, I can spend three or four hours with the Lord and pray and read the Word early in the morning. And you know what? It's not enough. It's not enough. Let me tell you, it's a good thing. I am getting so many sermons backed up, it's ridiculous. But I think most of them are just for me to hear. I just love hanging out with the Lord. And I'm not special. That's the way it is with all of us. There's that insatiable hunger for the presence of Jesus. Okay. Second thing. Thank you. They were cheering that point. The second thing present and a genuine follower of Jesus is the insatiable hunger to be like Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.1 says, Imitate God, therefore, in every, everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love. Following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Now remember, it's God that said, at the transfiguration, at the baptism, this is my beloved son whom I love. Listen to him. Remember, I've shared with you many times now, listen is the word that means, it's listen in its original, seated in its original language means hearing with the intent to walk it out. Not just to store it up, but to walk it out. So we're to live, let me read, let me read a little bit more of Ephesians building up to that. This is Ephesians 4.31, you don't have to turn there. Paul is saying to the church, get rid of all bitterness and get rid of all rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Hey, here's a little assignment on the side for you this, this um, afternoon after you wake up from your naps. You know what the first thing, the Gospels, you know, the first occurrence that took place after the Holy Spirit fell you know, the next thing that Jesus said, forgive. The enablement to do the impossible for us to forgive like Jesus forgave. Go look for it yourself, though. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore. In everything you do, all-inclusive, whatever touches your life, whatever influence areas, whatever arenas you're in, whatever you come up against, everything you do, imitate God. Well, how do I do that? 
We're his, we are his beloved children. So live a life filled, and that's to the fullest capacity, filled with love. And not the cheap version from the world, but the love of Christ. Following the example. He's the one we follow, Dan. 100%. Follow the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice us to us, for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jesting. These things are not for you. Instead, the alternative for your lifestyles, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral or impure or greedy person will ever inherit the kingdom of Christ of God. For a greedy person is an adul adulterer, idolater, forgive me, worshiping the things of this world. So don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey. Don't participate in these things as other people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you are full of the light of the Lord. So live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good, what is right, what is true. It's another sermon there. Three little evidences that should be manifesting out of your life, out of your speech, out of your actions, how you spend your money, how you think your thoughts. It should be from the source of light, Jesus Christ. And it's going to be good, and it's going to be righteous, and it's going to be truthful. And you know, God is a genius. All right. Ephesians 4, 1 says this, grow, 1 through 17, there's a phrase that says, grow in every way to become like Jesus. That is what God, creator of all things, has said. Be like my son, Jesus Christ. Dig in this, come and dine, as Daryl said last week. Come and dine on all this food that shows us how to be like Jesus Christ. Then we'll see effect from our life for the kingdom that'll blow our minds. Okay. Third thing. The third thing that should be present in a genuine follower of Jesus is the insatiable hunger to tell the world what he has done for you. Let me read you some more psalms. They're behind me. Psalm 9, 11 says, Sing praises to the Lord who reigns in Jerusalem. Tell the world about his unforgettable deeds. Psalm 66, 2 through 4. Sing the, about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. Say to, the, say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Your enemies cringe before your mighty power. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. Psalm 78, verse 4 we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. Boy, there's some power punch in those passages. Amen? Amen. When everybody says amen, I'll go on. Amen. Thank you. So there are several ways that we can measure whether we have this insatiable hunger to tell the world about what Jesus has done in our life. But let me just give you one, and then we'll go on. It's found in Romans 1 Verse 9, and Paul is saying, how do I know that I am serving God with a whole heart? You know, we're supposed to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he's saying, how will I know that I, that I love God with a whole heart? I mean, what, what's, what's the measuring device? Give me something that I can go, man, I'm really making progress in the kingdom of God. I'm really living a life that has a life of effect and not just coming to church once a week. So what's an indicator, God? Well, I'm giving you three. We just did the third one. But what's an indicator within this point number three? Romans 1, 9. How do I know that I'm serving God with my whole heart? Paul says, by sharing the good news of Christ. It's that simple. It's that simple. What comes out of my mouth and your mouth is what is ruling and reigning in my spiritual heart. You never hear me talking about Jesus. He's not reigning in my heart. Right. 
But you might be saying, well, wait a minute. Um, but, but I'm not Daryl or Stan or Craig, and I'm not Jesus, and I'm not the Apostle Paul. I don't have that, that office of an evangelist. I'm not, I'm not this or that. I cannot do this. We are clearly told in the word of God, Jesus tells us to be his witnesses. So that's just like Josh and I going to court. So like we go to court, and we saw an accident on 42nd of Broadway. So we're the only ones standing there, and it was a bad accident. Nobody really knows what happened except for me and Josh. And the uh, officer says, hey, I need for you guys to, to tell me. Uh, we just need you to come to court and tell us what you saw. And we both sit, and we are asked questions, and we answer those questions based on what we saw. We are witnesses of the fact that there was an accident, and this was the way it happened. Each one of us that are followers of Jesus are witnesses of what Jesus did in our lives. He took me and he took you if you are a follower of Jesus. And he took away the darkness that was in our heart, our calloused heart, our opinions, our self-promoting things. And he took it all away and he poured life and he poured light and the darkness was removed forever. As Daryl said, well, it was either Daryl Stan, I can't remember which one. Uh, I think it was one of those two guys. Um, at that point in time, we come to know Jesus Christ. We, we are justified forever. It's covered. But at that point in time, I start walking forward in my sanctification process to become like the Son of God. And it doesn't stop until the day I quit breathing the oxygen on this earth. So each one of us are witnesses. Now, Diane and I just, uh, we've, in the last couple of weeks, we've, in fact, we've been so many places and done so many things that I was like, I'm getting them all confused in the last 14 days. I was like, <clears throat> so, but one of the things we did was uh, we were in Louisville, Kentucky at a family reunion, and we were invited to go out to dinner uh, with a uh, the, our, one of the members of our family owns the uh, largest collection of Kentucky bourbon in the world. That's where, where we do. It's Kentucky. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, that's right. That's right. Communion was really different there. So anyway, uh, so we're sitting there. It's, it's a beautiful place. It's a restaurant, great food, and... Uh, you know, we were just talking with family and we're having a wonderful, wonderful time. And um, so one of the owners of the restaurant just said, uh, and it's a family member, just said, well, what, do you, what are you doing these days? So I just said, well, I, you know, I just stepped uh, aside from pastoring. Oh, you retired. And I did anything but retire. <laughs> I seated myself and positioned myself to run like I haven't run for the last 51 years because I want to end well and I want to see more fruit placed at the feet of Jesus and I know I can't do that except by backing up, submitting to him. But anyway, he just said, what? So, you know, what do you do with your time? Uh, so, uh, you know, what's it like? Just questions like that. And I said, man, I didn't want to be that guy. You know, that, you know, we've all been around people where it's just like somebody is just like they grab a Bible that weighs about 50 pounds, and they've got it stuck up underneath the back of their coat. And it's as soon as you say, well, I don't go to church. Oh, really? Ba boom, ba boom. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I wanted to be very, very careful. A lot of people were around, but I just, man, it just, when you know the Lord, and you know what I'm talking about, because you do know the Lord, you cannot help but tell, be a witness to say, man, Jesus took this worthless piece of flesh and gave it life and purpose and, and put in my heart and this divine assignment. And I want to finish that assignment. And I want to finish it well. And so do you. Amen. And just talking to him, and, and suddenly it was just like, I mean, I told Diane, it was just like, I wasn't over, it just starts flooding out of you. And you're just talking about the Lord and the largest collection of Kentucky bourbon in the world. She drank a Sprite, I drank a water. I'm a witness. So I found this very cool picture. I was thinking, Lord, what is some way to illustrate? 
I've been around a lot of people. Uh, we had a meeting in Nashville and we, uh, while we were gone, and just a lot of stuff that's happening. And you, you meet people that are very, you think are just like, well, these are really important people, well-skilled. And, and then you're around folks that are just, uh, we went to her family's farm and uh, just around a bunch of country folk. And just, uh, you know, I ate it up. I love that. And, uh, you know, I just thought everybody has this assignment. They've given them great life. And we have this great assignment. What's a, what's a way to communicate being a witness? Because this is what I think. Um, I'm just a witness. I'm just a soldier. And as I've said before, just like John the Baptist, he had a voice, remember? I am a voice crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Every single one of us, right? We're just a voice, bro. We're just a voice. We communicate. And I thought, I'm not, I'm not the source of the information. I'm just a courier. I'm just a radio guy. I strain to hear what the Lord is saying, and I get that from here. And then I pass the information on. And anyone can do that. So here's this little picture that I found. So that's an old World War II soldier in battle. I tried to find one where there were two guys in a foxhole. Uh, this is a radio operator. His assignment, his job in battle is to get instructions, commands from upstream and merely pass it on to the guy below him or next to him. That's all he does. And I thought, that's every believer. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do extraordinary things in extraordinary situations. We are nothing but soldiers, communicators, radio operators. We have the message of life. And so many times we're intimidated to not share it. Stan and I, for years, have gone back and forth. Stan said, you're an evangelist, you're an evangelist. And I go back and go, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not an evangelist. One of these days, Jesus will stand both of us up together and we won't care at that point. <laughs> to go, which? I'm just, I just love telling people about the Lord and I want to see them disciple. Jesus said, well, we'll get to this in a second. I found another picture, there are two. I like this one because he's looking up. It's like, what do we do? You know that his role, do you know that your, his role is so vitally important that he has all of the gear close to him so that he can communicate from his commanding officer, whoever is on the other end of that radio, giving the instructions, giving the commands. And when the battle is hot, when the heat is on, you need to know you've been trained already. You're pre-prepared. But the unexpected things, I mean, who saw COVID coming? I, I, I've, we've said this before. Tons of prophetic guys stood up after it was here. But was anybody a year or two or three, like we see so much of the Old Testament prophets, prophesying about this specifically? No. The answer is no. Qualified no. No, 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 no. Because for whatever reason, God didn't want to tell us. He just wanted us to be prepared. Same thing with Israel. Did anybody know? Well, yeah, we suspected. We knew it's dangerous. We knew they've been taking rockets. Did anybody know? Not even Israel knew. We didn't know with our communication. There's just some things where you find yourself like the ocean tide. Sometimes a wave comes in and it's big. Sometimes it's not. It recedes. That's kind of the way challenges are in the world. We live in a really challenging time. I mean, it is a challenging time. I've never seen anything like this before. This is what I know. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that because we're alive today, we have the greatest opportunity that we've ever had to speak what Jesus Christ told us to speak 
unashamedly and clearly and authentically. And that is, there's encouragement and there's life and there's hope and there's peace. But it's only in God. It's only through Christ. It is amazing sometimes the things that come along in our life that continue to uh, distract us. When Jesus said, I've got some life that I want to give. Okay, so let me, uh, let me wrap up here. Be the guy that just relays the message. Be that guy. Because Jesus said in Matthew 28, I've given you all the authority. I've given you all the authority to go and make disciples. Commanding them, uh, therefore go and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. Every follower of Jesus Christ should be, should have this insatiable hunger for the presence of God to be like Jesus Christ and to tell the world what he's done for you. Every single follower of Jesus, if you don't have these three things, then I really question whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus. Every single follower of Jesus Christ because he's what he, for what he's done, giving us life, should have this insatiable. And once again, what's that definition? That means I can be satisfied and content with the things in the world, wherever I have, what's going on. May not like it, but I'll be content with it. But I'll never be satisfied with enough of it. There's no, there's no such thing as too much of God's presence. There's no such thing as too much of knowing about the Lord, too much of knowing how to love him more. It doesn't exist in a follower of Jesus. You might have a rough day. You might have a rough year. When I first came to know the Lord, I didn't know, I remember in Louisville, Kentucky, after we first got saved, maybe a three or four weeks later, I came out of the church one day. Then I had hair, period. We've laughed about that before in years past. Hair down on my shoulders, and I'm standing outside, and I don't know anything much about the Lord except somebody said you're forgiven, and it's real, and it's a relationship, and you're going to get to go to heaven, and right now you're on a mission, Craig. And I just remember standing out in front of this church going, God, this is all I want to do is tell my buddies in the bands and the guys that I hang out with on the streets, it's about you. Some of them laughed. Some of them walked away. Very few of them actually listened. But I couldn't share much more than like, well, all I know is just we shouldn't be doing drugs. <laughs> we shouldn't be living immoral lives. I don't think we should be stealing stuff. What do you think? Basically, knowing that all of my sins are forgiven because Jesus went to the cross for me. I remember standing out Diana wasn't even with me. I'm sure she was in the church or something. But church was over, and I was just standing outside at the bottom of the steps at Calvary Assembly of God. And I just remember going, Lord, this is all I want to do is tell people about Jesus Christ. I don't even know how to make a disciple. I don't know where the make a disciple kit, where you get that. But that's what I want. Every follower of Jesus Christ should have a hunger that's there always during our earth life to be in God's presence, to be like Christ, to find out how Christ, what he did every day in every situation, and then to tell others about this incredible God that we serve. I just read a quote um, by Francis Chan, uh, the guy that wrote Crazy Love. Read it this past week, and it was uh, kind of funny because, you know, there are people that will, will go that will say, you don't have to be that intense in your Christianity. That is a lie. 
that is a lie. We have settled for 50 to 75 years of what church is like in the Western culture. And that's our paradigm now, our context. This is our context. This is our context. And it doesn't matter what the world does. And what the world might be saying even through the church is, this is the truth. Run with this and be effective. And so there are people that are just kind of going, well, man, you know, gosh, those guys are too intense or they want to spend too much time. I mean, I understand we have jobs. I understand we have families. I understand we have other priorities. If I don't cut my grass, it takes over the front yard. But I've added so many things in my life that the thing that I thirst for has been hidden among not evil things, but just stuff that I collected all along the way. And is it not the love, not judgment, is it not the love of God, the mercy of God, and the plan of God to take the things a little by little out of our lives until all of those other things that are not bad, but the living water is the thing that we're left with, that we focus on. I can do without graham crackers and those candy canes. My body won't do very well very long without this. So I just kind of clutter things up. Maybe some of the things that we're going through and the challenges, and we are on the brink. I mean, we're right at the edge of what could be World War III. Maybe not. It's all in God's hands. We're sure praying that it's not. But things can change real quick that you don't expect them to change. Right, Sue? You can fall over a tent peg and bust elbows. So be careful who you're listening to. Somebody that's just saying, man, God just wants to bless us. We've heard that message a long time. He does and he has, we pray, already. Ephesians says every spiritual blessing he's given us. So don't be deceived. Clear out everything in your life. Remove everything as a follower of Jesus. And find out what are the very valuable things. And the most valuable thing is that relationship with Jesus. And you'll be never satisfied. You're never going to be satisfied. Five minutes will turn into 15. 15 will turn into 30. Whatever you can do with your schedule. It's funny, I can... And this is me, I'm talking to Craig. I'm not, this is not saying to anybody else. I can get tired and I can find time to watch an hour program and television, even though I'm exhausted or whatever. But then uh, to find more time to read the Word, and I've just done that many times during my life. I'll do what's important to me. You'll do what's important to you. So let me finish with this. Let's just stand up. I think I'm going to have the worship team just come up. And I think we, we will close with whatever song they want to close with. But I just want to pray for us this morning. If you need to uh, say, Lord, it began, our, my relationship began with you like this glass of water on this table. Everything else was just pale in the periphery. And I know that there are important things that come up that are not bad things, that they're just things we have to deal with. So I'm not saying that we, we all go to some mountaintop or cave and do nothing but read the Bible 24 hours a day. I am saying this, if 
you ask the Holy Spirit, what are the things in my life that are preoccupying my time that should be spent with you? Would you show me? And then show me how to get him out of my life. And I promise you, he will. Lord, we know that we are standing in a time where there's tremendous opportunity. A time where there's fear and doubt and confusion. The one voice that we want to hear is the voice that brings life, and that's you, Jesus Christ. So I pray, Lord God, let all the other voices begin to fade and let us seek out with a hunger that will never be, a thirst never quenched, a hunger that will never be satisfied. Accept our time with you. Lord, I just pray in my own life, um, the life of my brothers and sisters here, the people that call this their church home, Lord, let us use this season, this time where there's been a great shaking that began and the things that just need to be put in the box. Help us to have the courage and the strength and the, the wisdom, the know-how to make room for the one thing that gives us life and that is our time with you to be like you and to tell others about you. If you want to come forward, you may kneel down and uh, you may not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just glancing around the room, most of you guys I know. But please, as, uh, during this song, and then Stan's going to close us and dismiss us.